All right, we're going to be in uh, <clears throat> 2 Kings chapter 17, and we're going to be talking about the fall of Israel this morning. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a timeline just to kind of remind you. Uh, you remember that Solomon dies and the kingdom was divided in 930. Jeroboam became the king of Israel. I know I'm repeating this, but repetition helps you remember, okay? And so Jeroboam was the king of Israel, the northern ten tribes. Rehoboam was the king of Judah, uh, the southern two tribes um, named Judah, and uh, the headquarters there was Jerusalem. Um, and then Judah experiences good kings and evil kings, okay? They have kind of a mixture of both throughout their history. But Israel is characterized by wicked king after wicked king. And so we're going to read the first six verses there in chapter 17, and then we'll uh, kind of kick off. And I've got to kind of move this morning because we're going to be covering some material. Uh, it says, In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hoshea, son of Elah, became king of Israel in Samaria, and he reigned nine years. He did, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not like the kings of Israel who preceded him. Now, basically what they're saying is that um, he's not quite as bad, okay? But he's still bad, you know? It's, it, it's kind of like a comparison there that we sometimes make to one another. But the point being is that he's still bad, okay? Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up to attack Hosea, who had been Shalmaneser's vassal and had paid him tribute. But the king of Assyria discovered that Hosea, Hosea was a traitor, for he had sent envoys to So, king of Egypt, and he no longer paid tribute to the king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. Therefore Shalmaneser seized him and put him in prison. The king of Assyria invaded the entire land, marched against Samaria, and laid siege to it for three years. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. He settled them in Hala and Gozan, at the, or on the Haber River, and in the towns of the Medes. Okay, And so the Medes and the Persians, he settled them in the area that would be modern-day Iran. Okay, That's where he took them. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the, the Israelites were settled there. Now, to help you just kind of break down those verses, we're, we're going to go through it in this way. We're going to talk about the conflict itself. And you'll notice in the text that what he does is he kind of works backwards. He talks about the conflict first. Because of Hosea and the other king's evil, he, God finally sends a, a nation in to conquer them, okay? And then to spread them all over the world, basically to, to overthrow them. And so he works in, in, in reverse. He talks about the conflict first, and then he talks about the cause, okay? Why God did that. And so we're going to look at the conflict first. Israel and Judah were basically vassal nations under Assyria. And, and to be a vassal nation, it meant that you were under the protection of a larger nation, okay? Um, they, they kind of governed you from afar. I guess it would... You could, you could talk about um, how at one time India belonged to Great Britain or, you know, something like that, and, and it gives you an idea. Um, but, but there was a little more, more to it than that. Um, you know, they were, the, the vassal nations like Israel and Judah were allowed to govern themselves for the most part, but they were required to pay an annual tribute to that king. So Israel and Judah would have been paying tributes to Shalmaneser, okay? And, and, um, and, and, and again, they're allowed to govern themselves as long as they don't get out of line. But honestly, usually the trouble began with failure to pay the tribute. I mean, it was really all about dollars and cents. If they weren't paying the treasures, if they weren't paying the king off, then that's usually when the trouble began. Now, the trouble for Israel was actually the result of two decisions, according to the text. Hosea had been accused of treason by Shalmaneser because he had met with So, or Sais, who was the king of Egypt. 
And so he's entered into talks with Egypt, another very powerful country. He's aligning himself with, with Egypt. And then um, the other thing is that he had stopped sending the tribute to the king of Assyria. And so um, Shalmaneser, king of, of Assyria, came knocking on the door. All right? And, and at first he had Hosea arrested. He put him in prison. Then next he conquered and seized the northern kingdom. And all the cities, most of the cities fell very easily, okay, because they wouldn't be well fortified. They wouldn't have a lot of soldiers there. But the city of Samaria was put under siege for three years. And, and that's not unusual uh, for a city to be um, laid siege to, uh, in, you know, for that period of time. Um, we would actually call these sanctions today. You know, if you remember, for how many years, well, 63, right? 62, I guess, uh, we had sanctions against Cuba. So for 50 years, basically, I think that's about what it was, wasn't it? That we had, you know, uh, sanctions against Cuba. And, and so what that basically means is nothing... No commerce could be done between Cuba and the United States. And, and so we would call them sanctions, but, but that's really not enough, to, you know, because you need to really look at the siege as sanctions on steroids, okay? Because they would literally go to this city, they would surround it, and, and then basically to tell you a little bit about the circumstances with the siege, nothing or no one was allowed to enter or leave. I mean, no one was allowed to enter. No one was allowed to leave. Nothing could go through. No supplies, no water, nothing like that was, you know. And so, um, you know, slowly the people within would run out of supplies. And so these kinds of things would happen. Fuel For fuel, folks would use their own dry waste to burn. Remember I told you about the prophet who laid naked on his side and cooked his food with his own waste. Well, that was a warning that he was giving to the nations of Israel and Judah. This is what's going to happen to you. The whole time he did that, by the way, he had a stick that he kept hitting against this model of uh, the, the, the city walls. And, and what he was doing is he was predicting the siege. You know, this is what they're going to do. They're going to come. You guys are going to be eating, uh, you know, cooking by your, your own waste. Water, uh, often people resorted to drinking their own urine during a siege. I know this is kind of disgusting stuff, but you need to, you need to understand uh, what, what really went on with it. And then finally, the cannibalism was not uncommon because they would run out of food. And, and so that's oftentimes what, what happens with um, a siege. Now the result of this particular siege, there was a vast deportation of the nobles and the capable farmers. So basically, the only people that they wanted to take with them were those who were able to survive. They took the very important people, you know, the movers and the shakers, the nobles, the, 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 the family names, they took them with them. And they also took the capable farmers because they could use them as slaves uh, in their own empire. And so uh, those were the people who were taken with them. The poor and the sick, the wounded, you know, all of that were left to fend for themselves. And so then Assyria did something that no other nation of its time really did, and this is part of what they were um, marked as being very cruel for. Um, they dispersed their peoples, their conquered peoples. They took them away from their foreign lands, and they placed them somewhere else, and they just spread them out among the nations. Now, I don't know if you know what that accomplishes, but it, it pretty much does away with your heritage, okay? You know? It's not just like what the, what the United States government did to the Apaches back in, you know, the, the, the turn of the century, the 20th century or before that, when they moved them to Florida or that area, you know, took them out of their native land and moved them. They at least allowed, allowed them to stay together. In this case, what they do is they take these people and they split up families and they split up, you know, you just 
your heritage then becomes mixed because when you grow up, there's, there's no one of your same race to marry. And so you intermarry with others, which actually happened back in Israel as well because those people who were poor and sick, who were left there, well, they, they began to intermarry with the other nations that were settled in Israel. See, it's not just that you were dispersed from your own land or taken from your own land, but they actually brought other people in to settle your land. I mean, it was a particularly cruel thing to do uh, to nations and races of people. And, And so they began to intermarry. The Jews who were left behind began to intermarry, and they became known as the Samaritans. All right? And this is the group that the Jews hate. And the Samaritans hate the Jews. And as we go through this series, we'll see some of the reasons why. Um, but quite honestly, part of it is just, uh, a huge part of it is just pride, you know, on both sides. So uh, these people become n- known as the, the, the Samaritans. Now, to give you a little bit, you go back and review the timeline a little bit. Judah experiences good kings and evil kings. Israel is characterized by wicked king after wicked king. And Israel falls in the year 722 B.C. That same year, um, the people are exiled and dispersed that same year. And so 722 B.C., the northern ten tribes of Israel are no more. They never will be again, okay? And so you get the, the ten lost tribes of Israel. That's if you've ever heard that that uh, terminology, then this is where it it takes place and becomes a reality. All right. So now, the cause. We're going to look at the cause for a little bit. And verses 7 through 23 describe the reasons for God's anger. And for brevity of time, you can read through them. We'll we'll look at a couple of key verses as we go along. But it, it describes the reason for God's anger, why he allows that conflict to take place, okay? And so here are the, you know, some of the reasons. All of it was a result of Israel's sin against God. You know, one of the things that we talked with uh, this lady, this young lady about on uh, Thursday was that, you know, that is what div- divides us, separates us from God. It, it's sin. It's all about sin, and, and, and one of the things we talked about is how the things that sometimes we deem as little sins and big sins, that before God, they're all the same thing. Uh, any sin causes us to miss the mark God has set is, is a problem, okay? Uh, it, it's a problem with him. It, it's a problem for us. And so we are separated um, from God as a result of sin. And so Israel's sin um, was things like rebellion against the God who had rescued them. That's what he says in the text. You have rebelled against the one true God who brought you up out of Egypt. He always reminds them. And why does he remind them of bringing them up out of Egypt? I mean, there's a specific reason for it. It's because when he brought them up out of Egypt he basically began to foretell what they would do. And they said, oh no, Lord, we will follow you. We will follow you. And so now he's reminding them, even though I brought you up out of Egypt, you have again rebelled against me. You know, over and over and over again. There's a a prophet in the Old Testament, his name is Hosea. And Hosea marries um, a prostitute. Her name is Gomer. You got to wonder what she looked like with a name like Gomer. But all, you know, all of this marriage was to illustrate the fact that that's exactly what Israel had done because Gomer kept running off and Hosea would chase after Gomer to bring her back. At one point, Hosea even pays to, bring, to purchase her freedom and bring her back. And and, and it's all to illustrate the relationship that Israel has with the one true God, Yahweh. Over and over again, God chases after Israel. And so he reminds them here, you've rebelled against me, the one who has rescued you, who brought you up out of Egypt. They worship other gods. 
um, the Baals and the Asherahs. Uh, uh, you know, the Baal and Asherah are actually, you know, goddesses, God and goddesses together. Um, but they worship these other gods. Uh, they share in the practices of the surrounding nations. Now, I do want you to see that verse because it's very, very important. If you look down... Um, Oh, let me see here. All right, verse uh, verse 8. It says, They worshipped other gods, and they followed the practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before them, as well as the practices that the kings of Israel had introduced. And so rather than following him and following his law, following his word, they just decided to look like the nations around them. Okay? Now, even the nation of Israel, just like the church, you know what, you know, the church, as the church, we are called out ones. We are called out. We are called to stand out from the rest of the world. Now, most of that is to be done by our love, the way we love. But part of it is done in our behavior, in the things that we hold on to, the things that we cherish. You know, that's part of where we look different than the world. And so what God is saying to them is that you, you don't look any different than the rest of the people around you. In fact, you share in their practices. You share in the practices that your kings have introduced to you. You know, um, they did secret things against the Lord. That's what this, these verses say, that they did secret things against the Lord. Um, and, and, and it kind of, it, it kind of is, is humorous to me because if you really know this, there is nothing secret before the Lord. Um, but they did. They, they worshiped in the high places. Now, let me get, give you a picture of what this may look like, that they, they would, you know, during the day, they would worship God. They would try to serve him. But then under the cover of darkness, they might sneak up off to the mountain and begin to worship some of the other gods, thinking that God couldn't see them, or at least thinking that no one else could see them doing this. And so that's the kind of thing that they did. You know, it kind of reminds me of, some of you are familiar with the movie City Slickers, and there's that, there's that, that very uh, famous scene where one of his buddies is saying to him about this lady this, that is on the cattle drive with them um, because there seems to be some attraction between Billy Crystal's character and her character. And so he says, you're telling me that if you had the opportunity that you wouldn't try to be with her. And he said, no, I wouldn't. He goes, even if, no, it always goes to this, this even if kind of thing. Even if a spaceship were to come down from the heavens and set down here and she gets off and no one is around and no one would know. And do you remember what Billy Crystal said? Billy Crystal said, I would know. All right? And now here's the deal, folks. Not only do we know those secret things, but God does as well. There is nothing that is secret before him. But it's interesting that the, the author here says they, they did secret things against the Lord because they thought they were doing them in secret. But God is an all-knowing, all-seeing God. All right. So now, <clears throat> Israel's sin, continuing that, they set up Asherah poles. Now, at times, Asherah poles were actually live trees. They would find a live tree or plant a tree, and it's made to represent the image of the goddess Asherah, all right? In some way, it's made to represent uh, her image. Other times, they were just simply wooden poles shaped to represent her. I get the picture of kind of like a totem pole, all right? Except with multiple heads on it, it would have the head of Asherah and maybe the shape of her body. I, I don't know. But um, that is, you know, what the Asherah pole was. And they worshipped around it. Um, they often danced around these poles. 
Um, and all of this provoked the Lord to anger because they had rejected him. All right. And yet God gives them an opportunity to repent. If you look at 2 Kings 17, 13, it says that the Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and seers. And he said to them, turn from your evil ways, observe my commands and decrees in accordance uh, with the entire law that I commanded your fathers to obey and that I delivered to you through my servants, the prophets. And so remember I told you last week that the prophets were the ones who came to share with the kings and the people God's will. And so God gives them an opportunity to repent, um, but uh, they do not. Um, it says that their response to this call to repentance is that they were stiff-necked and refused to trust him. Well, what's the term stiff-necked mean? Stubborn. Any of you ever had any dealings with a horse or anything like that? Horses can sometimes, mules, donkeys can become stiff-necked. Okay? I mean, you start to try to lead them and they just put their head up and they will not move it. You know, well, people can become stiff necked, too. And, and so it, it is very much noting that they are stubborn and that they refuse to trust God. Like we sang this morning, I've forgotten just how sweet your mercies are, Lord. And you need to remind me. You know, sometimes God reminds us gently. Sometimes he reminds us in more of a violent way, more of a, a disciplinary way. But, but understand this, when he reminds us with that discipline, the, the scriptures say that he loves us. He loves those that he chastises. He loves those that he disciplines. And so they were stiff-necked and refused to trust him. They rejected his commands and decrees. They worshiped worthless idols and even the starry hosts. They would even go out and worship the stars and the planets and uh, the constellation, constellations. They would, they would uh, worship all of these things. They sacrificed their sons and daughters in the fire. Now, this is stuff that you can read right there in verses 7 through 23. Um, they sacrificed their sons and daughters in the fire. And so God removes them from his presence. And he does it in a very permanent way, at least for the ten northern tribes. So now we've talked about we've talked about the conflict, the cause, and now we're going to talk about the cure. Okay, because at the same time all of this is going on in the northern kingdom, there is a king. If you notice in verse thirteen, he warns both Israel and Judah. Okay, and there is a king in the southern kingdom. Well, here we go. I always get ahead of myself. But you guys know this, right? That there's always two choices to a warning from God. There's always two choices to um, a decision that is placed before you from God. There is the wrong choice and there is the right choice. Okay? And Israel, the ten northern tribes, makes the wrong choice. Judah makes the right one because they choose to follow the word of the Lord. And so that brings us to 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. In the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places. He smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made. For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. It was called Nehushtan. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. So notice 
that he kind of puts a qualifier on both of these kings. The first one he says that he was not as evil as the kings who came before him in Hosea, although he was still very evil. And here he puts a qualifier on Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a good king unlike any of the other kings that have come before him or who would come after him, with the exception of David. You know, anytime you read that in this text, understand that David and Solomon were still looked at as being the model kings, okay? Um, if you see that there's been no king before him or no king after him, you can say that that's with the exception of David uh, and Solomon because we, all, you know, we believe Solomon repented in his uh, older years, but it was, it was too late. All right. So there in chapter 18, verses 1 through 5, Again, looking at a timeline, it says that Israel falls in 722. Isaiah's ministry is from 740 to 681. Hezekiah reigns from 715 to 686 B.C. And I want you to see Hezekiah's actions again, at least through these verses. First of all, he refuses to worship false gods and idols. And he's following his father Ahaz, who was not a good king. Okay, And so he basically begins to tear down everything that his father had built up. And so he absolutely refuses to worship false gods and idols. He destroys the high places, the Asherah poles. He ignores the traditions of men. And basically he breaks into pieces the bronze snake. Do you guys remember the bronze snake? It, it was placed out, out in the wilderness... Um, the people had sinned and God allowed these vipers to come before them and begin biting them. And because they were being bit by these snakes, they were dying. They were poisonous snakes. And so God instructed Moses to make this bronze serpent and to place it in the center of the camp so that the people could look at that serpent and be healed if they had been bitten by the snake. And so they hung on to that. They hung on to that bronze serpent that was made for one reason, and that was out there in the wilderness, and they hang on to it, all right? And so now they're worshiping it. They're burning incense to it. It's called Nehushtan, and they worship this bronze snake, and so he even takes it. And my, 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 my. You ever tried to move the, the, the organ out of the sanctuary or the pulpit? out of the sanctuary I remember at, at Old Union we had this huge pulpit you guys remember it was a big old thing and we decided to you know um, to, to move it and, and to put a smaller wooden uh, pulpit or wooden stand in its place and I remember for two weeks in a row we would move it, and we would come in on Sunday morning, and it would be right back there. <laughs> Did that kind of stuff happen at Northland, too? No? Okay. Because it did, you know. And, and so tradition is a hard thing, you know. Because people would go back, and they'd say things like, and I, I'm not making fun of this, okay. But they'd say things like, well, Gene Hout preached every sermon from behind that pulpit. Isn't it good enough for you? Well, yeah, but I get, I feel like lost behind this thing, you know? I'd rather be like right here, and, and so it doesn't suit my needs, and yet people hang on to that stuff, you know? And so that's what's happening. He's fighting against the traditions of men because, oh, imagine that. It wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just some preacher who, who had put this bronze serpent out there it was Moses I'd imagine there was some there were some folks who were pretty upset with him over this but he does it anyway because he's trying to get them back on the right track so he ignores the traditions of men um, and he exercises faith in God uh, one of the things that says is that he he trusts him he holds fast to him if you're going to hold fast to someone, you got to stay close, right? Yeah, you got to stay close to them if you're going to hold fast to them. Um, he didn't cease in following him. 
and he kept the law. There's that old uh, passage that says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And that's exactly what God did because of Hezekiah's actions. As Hezekiah sought him out, as Hezekiah placed his trust and his faith in him, then God blessed. About eight years after Israel fell, Judah is attacked by the new king of Assyria. The new king's name is Sennacherib. Sennacherib is actually very famous in, uh, in like uh, Eastern art, okay? Um, in, in what they call oriental art. Um, there's a prism, uh, this black obelisk that has his name on it. And basically what he says in that, on that prism is that I had Hezekiah held prisoner like a bird in a cage, but it never does say that he overthrew Hezekiah. And there's a reason for that. The Bible tells us what that reason is. And so... About eight years after Israel fell, Judah is attacked by this new king, Sennacherib. But Hezekiah and Jerusalem were well prepared for them. First of all, Hezekiah had built this tunnel. And this tunnel actually ran from the Gihon Spring to the Pool of Siloam. Now the Pool of Siloam, if, if you know anything about Jerusalem, the Pool of Siloam is inside the city walls. The Gihon Spring is outside the city walls. And so what Hezekiah does is he builds this tunnel, and, and basically tradition says that when they built it, they started digging from uh, both sides, and that when they came together, they were about three feet off. And so in the middle of this tunnel, you have to make this little jog, okay? But this tunnel was built for water to flow through it. So that if Jerusalem were to come under siege, they would have plenty of fresh water. You know, and no one knew about it. It was kept a secret. But Hezekiah had built this tunnel. And so the city was well, was well equipped to uh, face uh, one of these long sieges um, because of Hezekiah's tunnel. But even more than that, because God was with them. All right? Now... The commander of the army of Assyria begins to trash talk. I mean, that's what I would call it. Uh, they, the, the Assyrian army surrounds the city of Jerusalem. And so then before any fighting begins, before, before the siege really gets going, he begins to trash talk. And so I want to look at those verses. If you would look at uh, verse 19, and this is in um, chapter 18. It says, the field commander said to them, tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria says. On what are you basing this confidence of yours? You say you have strategy and military strength, but you speak only empty words. On whom are you depending that you rebel against me? Look now, you are depending on Egypt, that splintered reed of a staff, which pierces a man's hand and wounds him if he leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who depend on him. And if you say to me, we are depending on the Lord our God, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Come now, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can put riders on them. I mean, even in that, he's insulting. If you can put riders on them, how can you repulse one officer of the least of my master's officials, even though you are depending on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Furthermore, have I come to attack and destroy this place without word from the Lord? The Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. You know, I mean, the guy is a master at trying to terrify and manipulate uh, those within. I mean, he really is, because he hits on some pretty interesting things. Now, it says, Then Eliakim, son of uh, uh, Hil Hilkiah, and Shebna and Joah, said to the field commander, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, since we understand it. Don't speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people on the wall. But the commander replied, was it only to your master and you that my master sent me to say these things and not to the men sitting on the wall who, like you, will have to eat their own filth and drink their own urine? 
Then the commander stood and called out in Hebrew, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you from my hand. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says, The, the Lord will surely deliver us. The city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. Then every one of you will eat from his own vine and fig tree and drink water from his own cistern. Until I come and take you to a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey, choose life and not death. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for he is misleading you when he says the Lord will deliver us. Has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? And I hope you heard in there a couple of things. One is he promises them prosperity. You know? And, and my goodness, you know, in, in another two years, we're going to have two individuals. I just got an email this past week. Um, and it says, why is it that we choose from just two people to be the president of the United States, but we choose from 50 for Miss America? That's a pretty good question, ain't it? Now, you know, in a couple of years, we're going to be choosing someone. And, and here's, here's what I'm fearful of. Once again, people will fall into the trap that what they'll vote is like prosperity. They'll vote whoever promises uh, a vineyard of their own and a good cistern to drink out of, you know, because that's what they're promised, you know. We're gonna, in fact, we're going to take you to a place that's almost like this place, they say, is what they promise. And, and so he does a, a really masterful job of saying and trying to scare the Hebrew people. In fact, he even says, what God has of any nation has stood up against this king of Assyria. But there's a problem here, see? Because none of those guys were real. Hezekiah and the people of Israel know that their God is real and that he is a God who protects, that he is a God who redeems. And so all of this trash talking takes place by the king of Assyria. Isaiah hears this and he directs this response. If you look at chapter 19, verses 5 through 7, it says, When King Hezekiah's officials came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Tell your master, this is what the Lord says, Do not be afraid of what you have heard. Those words with which the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen, I'm going to put such a spirit in him that when he hears a certain report, he will return to his own country, and there I will have him cut down with the sword. And, you know, in our language today, at least whenever I was a kid, he's going to send him off with his tail tucked between his legs. And that's exactly what he does. Now, Isaiah gives Hezekiah that response, do not be afraid because I'm going to deal with this king. I'm going to deal with him and the commander. And so Hezekiah goes before the Lord in prayer. In chapter 19, verses 14 through 19, he prays to God for a victory. He prays to God for salvation uh, for the city and for the people. And then Isaiah prophesies about Assyria's defeat there in 19, 20 through 34. And if you would, just look at the last few verses there. Chapter 19, verse 32. says therefore this is what the lord says concerning the king of assyria he will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here he will not come before it with shield or build a siege ramp against it by the way that he came he will return he will not enter this city declares the lord and so even as they're beginning to set up camp these assyrians God says he's not going to enter the city. There's not even going to be an arrow shot into the city. This conflict isn't even going to get started here because I'm going to send him back by the way that he came. And then look at the next few verses. He says, I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. 
And that night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were, all, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. He went back the way that he came. And one day while he was worshiping in the temple of his god, Nishrach, uh, his sons, Adramalek and uh, Sher Sherazer, came, cut him down with the sword, and they escaped to the land of Ararat. And Asherahadon, his son, succeeded him as king. And so everything that God said came true. He's going to send him home, tail tucked between his legs, and then I'm going to have him struck down and his own sons assassinate him whenever he returns to um, Assyria. Now, the application, and I wrote this out just simply because I want it to be, um, I want it to be pretty clear, all right? I want to be well defined with it. But here's the application that I would make. For many in the church, there remains a great conflict in their lives. Um, many people outside the church, but even for some within the church, there remains a great conflict. Their hearts are under siege by the enemy, and they're pushed farther and farther away from the truth and the reality of God's grace. Um, and, and I know that because I meet people in the church who basically, um, it's like they feel so guilty all the time. And so you need to understand that there are people in the church who are under siege by Satan and his guilt. And he wants to set you free of that. You know, you keep hanging on to it. And you question God's grace and his mercy. Could he really love me that much? Can he take my sin and separate it as far as the east is from the west? Can, can he throw my sin into a place where he will never remember it against me? That's what he promises to do. And so there are people who are under siege. And, and don't fool yourself into thinking that because you're a believer that it can't happen to you. Because it can. At a, well... George Ross is the one who originally said this last statement. He said, the devil joined the church a long time ago, and every one of us is his target. See, that's what we sometimes forget. You know, right, right now, in, in this place, I mean, Satan is going to be at work. Because he doesn't need all those people out there. I mean, he doesn't need all them because he already has them. But he's at work in here. You know? And, and, and so um, he's very active. And he lays our hearts under siege, usually using guilt or pride, you know, or other emotions. He uses them against us. And so we, we are, you know, we, we're in conflict. You know, the, the cause of that conflict is the same as it has always been. The cause for that conflict is our sin. Sin separates us from God and continues to draw us away from Him. Just like the Israelites were guilty of shaping and forming our own gods, we mimic the society around us. And, and, and I know we try to fool ourselves into thinking that we don't. But, but most every one of us still chase after the pursuits of every other man and every other woman. And so we mimic the society around us and we, we praise God in the light of day while we do all sorts of secret things against God's will and against his plan in the cover of darkness. When we think no one can see us and if no one can see us, then that means that we're not guilty. Often we're just as stubborn. Amen? Often we're just as stubborn and, and untrusting of God as they were. But here is the good news. See, I'm telling you folks, some of you are saying, well, that's really a downer. But that's the human condition. That's our condition. It's who we are. 
But there is the good news. The good news is his, his name is Jesus. And he came to fulfill the law of God because we're not capable. We can't live up to it. Even more than that, he took our sin upon himself. He took a sin that had separated us from the Father. He took our sin and he made it his own sin upon the cross. And so now, when a man or a woman comes placing their faith in the work and life of Jesus Christ, God washes away our sin as black as it was and he clothes us with his own son. You know, Jesus really came with those two purposes in mind. He came because God had established a law that no man could live up to, and so he sent Jesus to live that out, to be perfect, to live it out in a perfect manner because Jesus was not capable of sinning. And so Jesus then became the perfect sacrifice. After he had lived that life, he was, he was viewed as being completely um, perfect, as righteous, as as God himself and then he goes to the cross and he takes our sin as that perfect sacrifice he takes our sin and he bears it upon the cross and then through the waters of baptism through the belief of our heart the confession from our mouths he comes and he washes us clean of, of any um, iniquity of any sin that we have uh, brought against him, he washes us. And then he identifies us as his son. When he looks at us, he sees his son. Because we are clothed with the very essence, the very character, the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that is the cure. That's the cure. The unrighteous made righteous as children of God. And that's his promise. And so this morning, we're going to sing a song of decision. And here's my challenge. A lot of times we just, we challenge basically, you know, three different groups of people. We say if you're outside of Christ and ever made a decision, then you would come at this time. Then we say if you're a believer in Christ and you wish to come and identify with uh, us as as fellow believers as a church here then you would come at that this time or if you're in need of prayer that you come now those things all still apply but there's there's one other there's one other application there's one other group that I want to to make known here if if you're that person that we've just described as being in conflict and if you know that the cause for it is maybe unrepentant sin, if you know that maybe it's unconfessed sin, if you know that maybe it's, it's even guilt or pride, pride that's maybe keeping you from forgiving someone else, or guilt that is keeping you kind of pushed down, then I ask that you respond. That you come forward and you just allow yourself to confess those those things to someone here there will be men and women who are available ladies um, we can have women come up with you you know because God tells us we don't have to live in that conflict anymore that we indeed can enjoy the cure who is Jesus Christ both Lord and Savior and he is Lord and Savior of all and he calls unto each one of us to walk in the relationship that he desires with us. So now's our opportunity to remove the obstacle. To remove whatever it is that stands in the way. And to allow him to draw near to us. Would you stand?